mysterious traveler. This is the mysterious traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, and it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can. Where are we going? Are we going to join Charles Foster as he takes an excursion into crime? I call the story, The Case of Charles Foster. Late one evening several years ago, when I was practicing medicine in a large eastern city, I visited Charles Foster, a friend and patient of mine. I took with me Flush, a cocker spaniel he had entrusted to me. Hello, doctor. Glad you were able to come. I see you brought Flush. Hello, Flush, old boy. He's missed you, Charles. I've missed him too, Doctor. Been quite lonesome without him these past few months. Ah, down, boy. It's a good dog. How do you feel, Charles? Oh, I'm all right, Doctor. You needn't worry about me. I'm glad to hear that. I suppose you've been quite puzzled about everything that's happened these past months. But frankly, Charles, I have. Even now, I find it difficult to believe that you... Could... Doctor, I'm going to tell you something that I've never told anyone. I thought I'd go to the grave with my secret, but... Well, you've always been friends, and I'd like you to know the truth. As you wish, Charles. It's strange how little people know of one another. For ten years, Agatha and I were married, and to the outside world, we were a happily married couple. But in the privacy of our home, I found life with Agatha a nightmare. I never would have guessed that. For ten years, I stood her sharp tongue and constant nagging. I might have gone on taking it the rest of my life. Fate hadn't decreed otherwise. It was three years ago on a beautiful spring evening that fate stepped in to change the entire course of my life. Is that you, Charles? Yes, Agatha. Did you remember to buy me some more of my cough medicine? Yes, here it is. Supper ready? Some men would be more interested in their wives' health than their own suppers. I'm sorry, Agatha, but you really don't look sick to me. That's because you don't care. I'm not well, and you know it. I work myself to death day in and day out keeping this house clean. And little thanks do I get for I've it. I told you before, Agatha, if the house is too much for you, hire a maid. And how exactly can we afford a maid on your miserable bookkeeper's salary? Well, if you can't manage it out of my salary, there's always the $50,000 your father left you. That money is mine, and I'm not spending a single cent of it. It's up to you to provide a maid. All right, Agatha. Please, let's not quarrel. Oh, hello, Flush. How are you, old boy? Oh, you care more about that dog than you do me. You know that isn't true. It is. Sometimes I think the only reason you come home is because of that dirty old dog. Quiet, Get away from me. All he does is eat and put his filthy paws on my furniture. I want you to get rid of that dog, Charles. Get rid of him? Yes. Buy some poison at the drugstore and dispose of him. You can't stand to see me have anything that makes me happy, can you? Well, I'm not getting rid of him. Charles, this is my house, not yours. And I don't want him here. Come on, Flush. <laughs> oh, don't think that by walking away that ends the matter, Charles Foster. You'd better get rid of that dog, do you hear? <sighs> Glad to get out of the house, eh, old boy? Yeah, uh, so am I. Uh, it's a beautiful evening, isn't it? Come on, boy, we're going to take a long walk. You want to turn around and go home now, Flush? <coughs> no, neither do I. Pardon me, but aren't you Charles? Julia! Julia Sanders! Uh, Charles, I thought it was you. Oh, let me look at you. Oh, Julia, you haven't changed a bit. You're as lovely as... How long has it been since we last saw each other? Ten years, almost eleven. Has it really been that long? Julia... Have you ever forgiven me for what happened? Of course, Charles. I was so insanely in love with you, Julia, that I couldn't bear to have other men look at you. You, you know that I didn't I mean... I know, to... Charles. I've thought of that night constantly. 
been like a nightmare ever since. Please, Charles, it's all past and forgotten now. You were perfectly justified in breaking our engagement. After what I'd done, there was nothing else you could do. I understand you married Agatha Winthrop a year after I'd gone abroad. Yes, Julia. After you left for Europe, people kept telling me well, what a wonderful wife Agatha would make me. I allowed myself to be convinced and married her. Well, I'm sure everything turned out for the best. Oh, but it didn't, Julia. Almost from the beginning, our marriage was a failure. For these past five years, Agatha and I have merely been living together under the same roof. Oh, I'm sorry, Charles, that it didn't turn out well. Nothing turned out well, Julia, after I lost you. I hope things have been better with you these past 11 years. Oh, I can't complain. I spent a number of years in Paris studying art and working at dress designing. Oh. I only came back a few months ago. You've uh, never married? No. I'm working now for Morgan's department store as their art director. Oh, really? Well, my, my office is only a few blocks from there. Look, Julia, why don't we have lunch together tomorrow? There are so many things I'd like to know. Well, I'd like to, Charles, but I think it would be much better that we don't. Oh, now, surely, Julia, there's no harm in two old friends having lunch together, is there? No, I suppose not. I won't take no for an answer. Do you know where Drake's restaurant is? Yes. Will one o'clock tomorrow be all right? Yes, that's my usual lunch hour. Good, then it's a date. Strange, isn't it, Doctor? The way after 11 years, Julia and I bumped into each other. If we hadn't, what followed would never have happened. It's such small things as an accidental meeting that often change the course of one's life. Yes, I know that now, but I didn't then. I met Julia for lunch the next day, and soon we were having lunch together every day. Mm. And for the first time in years, life began to mean something. Merely seeing Julia for one hour a day made life worth living. I understand, sir. We'd have lunch together, and then we'd go for a walk in the park. I sensed at the time that Julia, too, was lonely and in the need of friendship. The summer passed swiftly and happily. I should have realized that things couldn't go on that way, but I didn't. You mean you fell in love with Julia? Fell in love with her? I don't think I'd ever really stopped loving her. I became aware of how much I really cared for her one warm autumn day as we were walking through the park together. Julia? Yes, Charles? What about going to the theater with me tonight? Oh, I wish you hadn't asked me, Charles. Why? Because it means we can't go on seeing each other anymore. But why shouldn't we go on seeing each other? Because you aren't satisfied any longer just to see me at lunch, and it isn't right for us to go out together at night. But surely there's no harm in our going to the theater together. You're married, Charles. That's reason enough. All right, Julia. Forget I ever asked you. But at least we can go on having lunch together, can't we? No, Charles. Oh, but... Can't you see? Things can never be the way they were. We've become dependent upon each other, and we have no right to be. We can't go on seeing each other any longer. It isn't fair to Agatha. But you know that Agatha and I mean nothing to each other. We haven't for years. Nevertheless, she's your wife. Julia, you, you know I love you. I've always loved you, and I can't do without you. Charles, you're just making it difficult for both of us. Julia, you do love me, don't you? Yes. But can't you see? It's no use. I remember Agatha only too well. She'd never give you a divorce. I know she won't. I've asked her a dozen times in the past five years, but she said she'll never give me one. I want to part now, Charles. Right here. Must we? Yes. Goodbye, Charles. My life seemed to end that day, Doctor, with our parting. I went through the motions of living, but nothing seemed to matter any longer. I can well understand that. Well, months went by. Every day after work, I stayed in town, unable to face an evening at home with Agatha. When I did arrive home late at night, she'd be waiting for me. Is that you, Charles? Yes, Agatha. Sorry if I woke you. Now, lot you care. Coming in night after night at all hours. Leaving me alone in this big house. Oh, don't. 
don't think I don't know what you're up to. I know your kind, Charles Foster. You better go to sleep, Agatha. A fine chance I have to sleep with you putting on the bathroom light. You know I can't sleep when that now, light's on. Take me a minute to brush my teeth, then I'll turn off the light. Agatha. Well, what is it now? What's this bottle of prussic acid doing in the medicine chest? That's a deadly poison. I know that. I got it from Mrs. Smedley, the druggist's wife. She used it to get rid of an old cap they had. When I told her about flush, she said it What's was a thing... What's that about flush? I said Mrs. Smedley gave me that bottle of prussic acid so I could get rid of flush. I'm going to put him out of his misery tomorrow. You'll do no such thing, do you hear? If you so much as lay a hand on flush, I'll kill you. I'll kill you, do you understand? Yes, yes, Charles. You get rid of that poison tomorrow. Let's have no more talk of putting flush out of his misery. <laughs> for hours, Doctor, unable to fall asleep. Julia's breaking off with me and my wife's refusal to give me a divorce and the prussic acid she meant to poison flush with had left me all worked up. Then Agatha began coughing. That cough she'd cultivated for years to give people the impression that she was an invalid. Well, after she'd coughed her usual five minutes or so, she got out of bed and started for the bathroom where she kept her cough medicine. Oh! That chair. Why don't you turn on the light so you can see where you're going? I can see perfectly well where I'm going. Besides, on your salary, we can't afford to waste electricity. I knew there wasn't any use in saying anything more. For years, Agatha had gotten up every night and groped her way to the medicine chest where her cough medicine was. Nothing could make her change her habits. I lay in bed listening as she opened the medicine chest and fumbled in the corner where she always kept the bottle. As I heard her groping for her medicine, I suddenly thought of the bottle that was standing next to it. The bottle of prussic acid. Without thinking, it came to mind. If only she'd take the prussic acid instead of the cough medicine. If she did, I would be free. Free of her constant nagging and whining. Free to see Julia. Then I knew it was useless to hope for such a mistake to happen. Agatha's cough medicine always stood in the same corner of the medicine chest. Even in the dark, she'd never take the bottle of prussic acid. And then... And it came to me. What if the bottles were to be switched? What if the following night the prussic acid were placed in the customary spot of the cough medicine? Suddenly it was all very clear to me what I was going to do. Agatha? <laughs> well? Agatha, I've been thinking over what you said about flush. What? I suppose you're right. Flush should be disposed of. He certainly should. He's old and he's smelly. It'll be a blessing for him to be put out of his misery. Yes. Of course. I'm sorry I shouted at you before, Agatha, but, well, I see now that you're right. Hmm. When are you going to do it? Oh, we'll wait until Saturday. And none too soon, either. Uh, you're sure the prussic acid won't make him suffer? Nonsense. Of course it won't. Mrs. Smedley said nothing worked faster than prussic acid. Oh, you told her what it was for. Uh, that's fine. Very well, Agatha. Just leave everything to me. <laughs> Next night, Doctor, after Agatha was in bed, I quietly stole into the bathroom and opened the medicine chest. I compared the bottle of cough medicine with that of the prussic acid. They were both small bottles, almost identical in size. I removed the cough medicine from where it stood in the corner of the chest and replaced it with the poison. Then I went to bed and waited impatiently for Agatha to start coughing. <laughs> Can I get you a glass of water or something, Agatha? Oh, water won't do any good. What I need is my cough medicine. Oh, that's that chair. Why don't you turn on the light? Because I can see perfectly in the dark. Besides, someone's got to economize on the electricity in this house. I lay there in the darkness, listening to her grumble as she opened the door of the medicine chest. The blood pounded in my ears as I heard her fumbling with the bottle. Would she feel a slight difference in the bottle when she picked it up? Scarcely able to breathe, I waited. Listen. And she fell to the floor. I quickly got out of bed, turned on the lights, and went into the bathroom. She was lying on the floor, quite dead. There was an agonized look on her face. I returned the bottle of cough medicine to its proper place, and then I phoned the police. <laughs> Now, 
Now, you say, Mr. Foster, that your wife was in the habit of going every night to the medicine chest for a few drops of her cough medicine. Yes, that's right. And she never turned on the lights when she went to the medicine chest. Oh, no, sir. Wasn't that a bit unusual? Well, I always used to tell her to turn on the lights, but she said it was a waste of electricity. I see. And you say your wife... It was her who placed the bottle of prussic acid in the medicine chest next to her cough medicine, eh? Yes, sir. I I'd never touched the bottle of prussic acid. You see, it was my wife who procured it, and she... Yes, yes, Mr. Smedley, the druggist, has testified that his wife gave it to your wife. Mr. Foster, are you familiar with the contents of your wife's will dated ten years ago? I, uh, yes, I am. Then you know, of course, that your wife left her entire estate to the home for the aged. Home for the aged? Oh, yes, yes. I fought to keep my face expressionless to prevent him from learning that I hadn't known. All the years we'd been married, Agatha had given me to understand that all her money would go to me. Now I knew that she'd been lying. Her will had been made out in favor of the home for the aged for years. I began to feel angry at the way she'd cheated me. But a moment later, I was grateful that she had. Frankly, Mr. Foster, your wife's death occurred under very suspicious circumstances, to say the least. For years, she'd gone to the medicine chest every night without mishap. And yet, on the second night that there was a bottle of prussic acid in the chest, she met her death. Were it not for the fact that your wife had left her entire estate to the home for the aged, I might be inclined to go further with this investigation. As it is, I'll instruct the coroner's jury to bring in a verdict of death through accident. That's all, Mr. Foster. walked out of the district attorney's office a free man. A few days later, I moved out of the house which had been Agatha's and took up quarters elsewhere. Six long and uneventful months passed. I made no effort to contact Julia for fear that the police might still have their suspicions, and then I could stand it no longer. I, I called on her. Ch Charles, when I was told you were waiting to see me, I could hardly believe it. I'm so glad to see you again. Thank you, Julia. It's good to see you again, too. Charles, you don't look well at all. Now, these past few months have been something of a strain, Junior, but I'm all right now. I was tempted so many times to get in touch with you. Then I thought perhaps you didn't want to see anyone. Well, I did want to see you, Julia, but I was afraid it wouldn't look right. I understand, Charles. Now, let's not say anything more of the past. Only the present and the future. Julia, do you think we might try to pick up where we left off last autumn? We can try, Charles. Julia and I, Doctor, began to see each other night after night. Life for me became exciting and wonderful the way it had been 11 years ago before Julia and I had broken our engagement. Didn't you ever stop to think of what you'd done? You mean... Agatha? Yes. No, Doctor. They say that a murderer is ever haunted by his crime. But that isn't true. Hmm. Uh, at least it wasn't in my case. To me, Agatha was part of another life in the dim past. I rarely thought of the past, only the present and the future. Now, if I had any fears at all, it was the fear that something would spoil the happiness that Julia and I had found together. But nothing did... And a few months later, we were married with you as my best man. Yes, I remember. And my second marriage was everything that my first hadn't been. The first time in my life I knew what true happiness meant. Julia and I were poor, but that didn't matter. For we had each other. The months swiftly passed. And as our first anniversary approached, it was hard to believe that we'd been married almost a year. Charles, before you leave for work, will you sign a check for me? Oh, who's it for, dear? Never you mind, Mr. Foster. You just leave a signed check. I'll fill in the amount and the party it's meant for. Mrs. Foster, you're acting very mysterious. Well, a wife has a right to act mysterious once a year. <laughs> Darling, I suspect you're going to use this check to buy me an anniversary present. Well, whatever you get me, please don't make it neckties. Well, I'll have you know I have very good taste in neckties. I know you do, dear, but I have to wear them. You're an ungrateful <laughs> wretch. Very well, I won't get you tied. Good, then I'll sign the check for you. And please bear in mind that you can't make this check out for more than $312.50. That's all we have in the bank. Oh, I'll leave you at least the 50 cents. You'd better leave a good deal more. Oh, we won't be going up to Lake Ellis. Charles, are we going up to Lake Ellis? Oh, it slipped out. 
And I meant it as an anniversary surprise. Oh, Job, that's wonderful. When are we going? This Friday afternoon. I've rented a cabin and a small motorboat on Lake Ellis for the weekend. Oh, darling, what an exciting surprise. Charles, you're sure it won't be too expensive? Why, nothing can be too expensive for our first anniversary. <laughs> oh, darling, I've never <laughs> been so happy. <laughs> This looks like a nice place to fish. Let's see, where'd I put that bait? Here it is, dear. Thanks, darling. Uh-huh. Ah, here's a nice, fat, dimpled worm. <laughs> well, if you can't stand to see me bait him, just turn the other way. That's it. It'll only take me a minute. Charles, look. Yes, we'd like it this There's hooker. smoke coming out of the engine hatch. What's that? Yes, you're right. It's on fire. There are flames shooting out. Fire extinguishers at the other end of the boat. Charles, you'd never make it. You'd be burned. Yes, you're right. Besides, even the extinguisher wouldn't do much good now. The fire's too big. What are we going to do? Oh, the heat, it's becoming unbearable. There's only one thing we can do, Julia. Let's go over the side. We're almost in the center of the lake. I can't swim. But I can, dear. I'll manage to keep us above water somehow. Well, all right, darling. I'll do whatever you say. We'll come through this, Julia. Now, don't be afraid. Now, I'll slip over the side of the boat first, and you follow. All right. Now, hurry, Julia. Let yourself down into the water. I'll keep you afloat. Yes, Charles. Ah, that's it. Now, now, let go of the side of the boat. I have you. Yes, Charles. Now, don't be afraid, darling. You see? It's no trouble keeping you above water. Now, now just relax, dear. While I swim with you a bit, we've got to get a good distance from the boat. It may explode. Yes, Charles. Do you see any boots, Rob? No, but someone's bound to see the fire and come to our rescue. Until they do, we must have courage. Aren't you, Charles? No. Now, don't worry, dear. I can keep us afloat for a long time yet. Oh, why doesn't someone come to our rescue? They will. Someone must surely have seen that boat burning. But, Charles, we've been in the water so long. Oh, it just seems long, darling. It can't be more than ten minutes. Ten minutes? It feels more like... Charles! I've got you, Jenny. I just for a moment, you... You slipped away from me. Oh, darling, it's no use. I'm just a millstone around your neck. What, what are you saying? Why should we both drown? Charles, save yourself. Save myself? Yes. I want you to let go of me. Let go of you? No. No, never. Yes, you must. You're too tired to keep me. No, no darling. Either we're both saved... Oh, we're both drowned. Oh, I won't have you throw your life away. Let go of me. Oh, Julia, Julia, stop trying to break loose. Julia, darling, don't. I can't live without you. Julia, stop struggling. Julia! Help! Help my wife! My wife! She... Yeah, yeah, we saw it all. Hey, Mike, he's passed out. Get him before he goes under. Yeah. Uh, I got him. Here, help me get him aboard, Skipper. All right, all right. Any sign of his wife? Uh, she's gone, Skipper. Yeah, too bad. Well, if it's the last thing I do, I aim to see just a stand of this fella. She never had a chance. Did you see him shove her under? It was murder, that's what it was. Mr. Foster, both of the men who rescued you claim that as they approached you and your late wife in their boat, they saw you struggling with her. You admit this? Yes. Yes, but I tell you, I was trying to save her, not drown her. No, you were trying to save her. But both the witnesses testified they saw you push her head under. Oh, they're wrong. I wasn't pushing her under. I was trying to bring her to the surface. You must believe me. Oh, Mr. Foster. You maintain that you were rescuing your wife. Not drowning her. Yes. Is it true, Mr. Foster, that you were engaged to your wife 11 years ago and that she broke the engagement? Yes, that's true. Would you mind telling the jury why she broke the engagement? 
We... We had a misunderstanding. A misunderstanding? You call shooting the woman you're engaged to just a misunderstanding? No, no. You must let me explain. It's true that 11 years ago I did shoot Julia, but I've been drinking. I didn't know what Mr. I was doing. Mr. Foster, you do admit shooting and wounding her. Yes, yes. Have you ever seen this before? Why, yes. That's the insurance policy I took out for Julia and myself. Exactly. And when was this policy taken out? Well, about a month ago. June 15th, to be exact. And what's the value of this policy, Mr. Forster? Well, if either my wife or myself died, it provided $10,000 for the survivor. Yes, Mr. Forster. If either you or your wife died a natural death, it provided $10,000 to the survivor. But there's also a double indemnity clause in this policy, isn't there? Yes, but I... One that provides you with $20,000 if your wife died an accidental death. Such as drowning. Yes, that's true, but I swear I didn't drown my wife. I tell you, I was trying to save her. Save her, not drown her. You must believe me. You must... And that, Doctor, is exactly the way everything happened. Strange, isn't it? The way justice works itself out. I committed murder and escaped punishment. Now I'm paying with my life for the death of the one person I really loved. It's time to go, Foster. All right, Warden. Goodbye, Doctor. And take good care of Flush, will you? Of course, Charles. Goodbye. All right, Warden. I'm ready. Let's go. Traveler again. Did you enjoy our little trip? Too bad about Charles Foster, wasn't it? As he was strapped into the electric chair, there was an ironic smile on his lips. For he was being executed for something he had not done. But as Charles himself said, justice has a strange way of working itself out. I knew another man once who thought it would be a simple thing to dispose of his wife. Uh, unfortunately, he... Uh... Oh, you're getting off here? I'm sorry. But perhaps we'll meet again soon. I take this same train every week at this time. You have just heard Chapter 64 of The Mysterious Traveler a series of dramas of the strange and the terrifying. In tonight's story, the case of Charles Foster, Humphrey Davis played Charles Foster, Nancy Sheridan played Julia, and Joan Shea played Agatha. The Mysterious Traveler is written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, and original music is played by Henry Silvern. The entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. <laughs> Listen next week to a tale titled Blood Money. Another tale of the mysterious traveler. The Mysterious Traveler is presented by WOR Mutual from the WOR Studios in New York. This is Mutual. <laughs>